Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming to this talk. How many of you were on my previous session about Java 9? Uh, a few people? Okay, thank you for coming again to this talk. And to check again how many of you are Java developers. Okay, almost all of you, that's good. So this topic is uh, a bit more advanced, so I'll try to explain the concepts uh, as simply as possible. Uh, you can also interrupt me during the session and ask questions or wait until the end. So in this session, basically, I'll show you what are the new security enhancements in Java 9. And some of them are quite interesting, so I'll use some demos to, to demonstrate them. First, a few short words about me. Uh, for the ones who weren't to my previous session, my name is Martin. I'm a Java freelancer. I'm one of the guys who helps organize the events of the Bulgarian Java user group, where we have our own community conference called JPrime. I'm a big open JDK and Oracle database enthusiast, and I tweet mostly about Java. And in this session, basically, we'll cover some of the most significant security enhancements in Java 9. Namely, these are um, what is DTLS and what is DTLS support provided in Java 9. Uh, before that, we'll discuss briefly what is the support for the transport layer security protocol in JDK before Java 9. As most of you know, this is the successor of the SSL protocol, which is one of the most widely used protocols for securing uh, internet and uh, not only communication. Uh, we'll check also what is the TLS application layer protocol negotiation extension, which is a very interesting enhancement in the TLS support provided in JDK 9. And we also look uh, shortly at the other security enhancements which are out there. So TLS in JDK, what is the TLS support provided in uh, the Java platform? Up to Java 9, uh, the Java platform tried to be uh, as up-to-date as possible with the latest specifications of the TLS protocol. Uh, we have uh, implementations of TLS 1.0.1.1 and 1.2, which is the latest version of the TLS protocol. And soon we expect TLS 1.3, which probably would be supported in the next releases of the Java platform. Uh, apart from being used to secure most application protocols out there, TLS uh, is also used, as many of you might know, about uh, establishing SSL VPNs within a company. Um, nowadays, as you know, most websites go with TLS support, and many companies uh, more and more start enabling TLS within the premises of their own networks. So. TLS is gaining more and more popularity, and we as Java developers need to be aware of what's out there in the JDK platform, how to use it, and um, what's implemented, basically. So just before we talk about TLS, one of the most significant things we need to understand is what is the TLS handshake process. This is basically the initial step uh, before any TLS communication ha can happen. And some of the enhancements which are provided in the JDK are reflected based on this TLL TLS handshake process. So to look into the steps, it's basically a multi-step uh, packet uh, exchange process, which basically establishes the communication channel between a client and the server. In the first step, basically, the client sends a so-called client hello packet, which basically specify what version of TLS does the client support and what cryptographic shifters are supported by the client. These include different kinds of cryptographic algorithms, uh, message digest algorithms, and basically everything that's needed to establish the communication between the client and the server. The server receives that hello packet from the client, uh, determines what's the TLS version that the server might use, what are the shifters that the server supports as well, and that are provided by the client, and responds with a server hello request. In the server hello request, the server all also sends its own public certificate, which basically contains the public key of the server that's used by the client to encrypt messages. When the client receives the public certificate, it uh, aims to verify that certificate using uh, a certificate authority. As you know, uh, a server might also have a self-signed certificate, which basically doesn't have any certificate authority attached. But if the client needs to verify the server certificate, it uses basically the information in the certificate to check what is the security authority. And we, here we have different ways that the client can use to verify the certificate. We have the so-called certificate revocation lists, which are basic, is basically just a flat list of certificates that the certificate authority publishes. And these are certificates that might have expired, have been revoked, and so on and so forth. Another way that the client can do certificate checking is by using the so-called OCSP protocol. 
OCSP protocol is a more advanced way to do certificate revocation checking. And another thing that's introduced in JDK9, and we'll see in a few slides, is so the so-called OCSP stapling mechanism. OCSP stapling basically is a way for the server and not the client to check the certificate, uh, whether it's valid against the certificate authority. And uh, we'll see how we can enable OCSP stapling. Uh, when the client verifies the certificate, as a fourth step, the client may optionally send its own public certificate to the server. And this might be required if we need to establish bidirectional communication between the client and the server. But this step is optional in many scenarios. When the client optionally sends its client certificate, um, the client also sends a, a shared secret key that's used by the client and the server to encrypt the messages. And when the server receives that secret key from the client, uh, the client also uh, marks uh, the communication, the handshake as finished, and the server also confirms the handshake as finished. And at that point, the client and the server can start exchanging messages in, in a secure fashion. So this is basically the TLS handshake process. Uh, now in terms of uh, Java and how basically Java does provide implementation of TLS and eventually of this handshake process, we have so the so-called um, Sun JSSE or Sun Java Secure Socket Extension. This is basically just an extension of the standard Java sockets as you know them. Um, how many of you have done some kind of socket programming? Uh, okay, like five, six people. Um, we'll basically see briefly how we can create secure socket communication. It's very similar to how you would create a simple socket connection without any TLS support. Um, basically, the JCA provider, which implements the Java Secure Socket extension, uh, has APIs for blocking and non-blocking mode of operation. And the non-blocking mode of operation is one which is not that used in practice because it's much more complex. People tend to use um, third-party libraries to establish non-blocking TLS communication. We also have an API which is called HTTPS URL connection, which is uh, specifically used to establish communication with HTTPS endpoints. HTTPS uh, being, of course, uh, HTTP over TLS. Uh, now, in terms of the blocking mode of Java Secure Socket extensions, it's provided by the SSL socket class, the API of the SSL socket class. As we already said, it's, it can be used as a standard socket. And handshake, uh, might be triggered during several steps when you establish the socket communication. First handshake might be triggered explicitly if you call the start handshake method of the socket. This triggers the whole handshake process. Another way is by calling the get session method to retrieve the current session between the client and the server socket. If a handshake hasn't been triggered, the get session method triggers one for you. And the third way that SSL handshake might be triggered when you communicate between the client and the server is by trying to write and read to the socket. If handshake hasn't been established, then the read and write methods trigger the handshake process. To give you a more concrete example, um, this is basically an example of an SSL server socket. Uh, first, we set two properties to specify the key store and the key store password. The key store basically stores the public certificate uh, of the server and it, the key store is used to serve that public certificate to the client. Then we use an SSL server socket fac factory to, to create the server socket. Um, and I create server socket on port 4444. Um, and then I do a loop. I say uh, server socket.accept. At this point, this is a blocking operation, as you might imagine. And at that step, I'm waiting for some uh, message from the client. When I receive a message, I get the input stream from the server socket. And uh, I also print something to the client. Uh, in that particular case, hi client. And the, at the end, I close my uh, input and output streams and also the server socket. This is a very simple example of how you can create an SSL server socket. As you can see, it's very similar on how you'd, you would create a simple socket server without TLS. And this is the client. The client also uh, specifies trust store. The trust store basically is used to store information about the trusted certificate authorities. Some of them are like Verizon, and we have several other notorious certificate authorities. Uh, so the client basically needs to specify the trust store in order to specify the information on which certificate authorities are trusted by the client. Then I use an SSL socket factory to create SSL client connection, and I create the SSL client socket again on port 4444. 
What it does, it uh, creates a print writer from the output stream of the client socket, and it writes high server to send a message to the SSL server, and at the end, basically, it reads uh, some response from the server and closes the socket and the input-output streams. This is a very simple example of, a, of the client. Now, in terms of the non-blocking API, as we already mentioned, it's much more com complex than the socket API. And why is that? Basically, it's provided by a class called SSL Engine, and that class has two methods called wrap and unwrap. These methods are much more uh, complex because they make use of the so-called application and network byte buffers. Those buffers are used to buffer information which is uh, written and read uh, from the SSL engine. And basically, the wrap and unwrap methods are used to read and write information to those buffers. From the network buffer, messages are sent to the network, to the server, and the application byte buffers are used to basically receive uh, messages to the application. So the flow is the following. Uh, the SSL um, client writes messages to the byte buffer, and they are sent using the wrap method to the network byte buffers, and from there, the network sends them to the SSL server. And when we read messages, they are read from uh, using the unwrap method from the network byte buffers to the application buffers from where they are retrieved by the, by the client. Uh, and handshake, in that case, might also be triggered by calling uh, different methods. For example, you can explicitly call begin handshake method from the SSL engine API, which triggers the handshake process. Or you can call wrap and unwrap. And if the handshake, the TLS handshake, hasn't been established, it's triggered. Um, this API is much more complex than the SSL socket API. You have to consider a number of things. It's typically used along with an API which predates Java 9. It's called socket channel. Uh, a socket channel is an API to establish non-blocking communication over standard non-TLS sockets. And typically, if you want to debug your TLS communication and see what happens during the TLS handshake process and when you exchange messages in a secure fashion, you can enable uh, several properties. In particular, one of the most uh, useful one is called javax.net.debug. This basically prints out at the low level all the packages that packets that are exchanged between the client and the server. And you can also filter out that information by specifying, for example, that you want to only see those messages during the handshake process. In that particular case, you can say javax.net.debug equals handshake. And this will print out only the packets that are sent during the TLS handshake process, but not during the actual communication. Uh, now, this is what we have up until Java 8. Now, let's see what we have in JDK 9, having considered that background information. In Java 9, we have uh, support for DTLS. DTLS is uh, called Datagram Transport Layers um, uh, Security, and this is basically TLS over an uh, unreliable protocol uh, like uh, uh, UDP. Originally, most uh, use cases for TLS uh, are based on top of TCP, but there are many scenarios where, where we need to secure also UDP communication between parties. And here is where the DTLS protocol comes in handy. For DTLS specifically, as we already said, it's TLS over unreliable transfer protocol. Uh, it uh, basically, you don't have reliable any non order gar delivery guarantee. So basically, packets that are exchanged between the client and the server can be received in any order. And also, some of them might be blocked. You don't have guarantee that they are received. Uh, and it also targets to secure an reliable mm. protocol. Some examples are DNS, uh, session initiation protocol, which is used in chat applications explicitly, and so on and so forth. The DTLS protocol is, well, uh, is specified by a well-defined specification, which follows the TLS specifications. So currently, there is version 1.4 oh yeah. as well. You just connect to the microphone if you need to. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, DTLS follows closely the TLS specification protocols, and currently version 1.3 is in draft. So, future versions of Java will probably support that, but up until now, we also have support for DTLS 1.2. Um, and there are some specific uh, things in regard to DTLS when we compare it to TLS. Uh, one thing is that there is an additional sequence, num sequence number field in the DTLS protocol, which specifies the sequence number of the packet. And that field is used for, for you, the application developer, to reorder uh, the packets in the proper order. Uh, some support for some cryptographic shifters is, uh, is dropped, such as for RC4. This means that the DTLS doesn't support all the cryptographic shifters as TLS. 
Uh, we also have a new field uh, which is called retransmission timer that's used to retransmit packets that are dropped or are not received in time. Uh, we also have some additional uh, changes which are, for example, if you uh, mark verification which basically verifies the, the integrity of the message that is being sent uh, is failing. This triggers warning instead of failure in the, in the, hel in the handshake process. And we also have a new request message, which is hel hello verify request, which is uh, basically added to identify the sender of the message. This one is missing from TLS. And before Java 9, if you wanted to use DTLS in your applications, you had different options. For example, you could have used the Bouncy Castle Java Secure Socket extension. Bouncy Castle, how many of you have used Bouncy Castle? as a library, two or three people. So Bouncy Castle is uh, one of the most standard Java libraries which provide implementation of, the m of many cryptographic algorithms and they follow the, the standards provided by the JDK APIs. And the API which Bouncy Castle provides for uh, DTLS is fairly simple. It's just a few lines of code that you can uh, write in order to establish uh, DTLS communication. Another option you might have before Java 9 is to use an external API or basically to call an external API uh, via JNI. And for example, you can interact with OpenSSL via JNI if you want to use DTLS. Uh, OpenSSL provides DTLS support since quite some time. Uh, so as we already said, JDK 9 provides support for DTLS 1.0 and 1.2. Uh, implementation is basically adapted to the current Java Secure Socket Extension API that we saw a few slides before. Um, also, we have an adaptation of the non-blocking API through SSL engine for DTLS. And one of the main drawbacks of DTLS is that it's fairly hard to use in JDK 9. Since basically it's an adaptation of uh, the SSL engine class, uh, we'll see uh, during the demo that there is quite some code that you need to consider if you want to establish DTLS communication in JDK 9. So we're not, it's not very trivial to, to get started with DTLS. Um, one, an one other specific thing about the DTLS implementation in JDK 9, uh, order delivery is guaranteed during the handshake process in JDK 9. As I already mentioned, DTLS doesn't guarantee order delivery of packets. However, for the purpose of handshake, this is guaranteed by the JDK implementation. And the reason for this is because handshake must be reliable. You need to be able to establish the handshake process without uh, dropping any packets or without receiving packets in a different order. Uh, another thing is that, uh, for that reason, the red delivery of messages uh, during the handshake is done automatically by the JDK implementation. But if you want to do it in your application, you need to do it yourself. So you need to make sure that you re-deliver re failed messages. And this is how you can use uh, DTLS in JDK 9. You get an instance of SSL context. SSL context is the entry point class that's used to, to create uh, DTLS communication, and you say SSL context dot get instance DTLS. From that instance, you can uh, specify some things like the, the key store, the trust store, and other initialization parameters. And then you create an SSL engine by calling SSL context dot create SSL engine. Here you can specify the port, the host name for the SSL engine. Uh, and here I specify that I use client mode, basically SSL engine, similarly to the socket API, can be used in a client and server fashion. And then basically we can start exchanging messages using the wrap and unwrap methods. Uh, however, still on the internet, if you try to find some good examples of DTLS, you won't find many. Some good examples are provided by the JDK9 test suite. So if you go to the Mercurial repositories of JDK9, you can see several good unit tests that demonstrate how is DTLS used. But still, if you want to get started with DTLS out, uh, suggest you go with the Bouncy Castle library. Now, another interesting extension in JDK 9 is the application layer protocol negotiation, which is uh, much simpler to understand and much simpler to use than uh, the TLS. Uh, ALPN is used to identify the application layer protocol during the TLS handshake process. Uh, one good use case behind this is HTTP2. This is the new version of the HTTP protocol that's coming. You know that many sites might basically support HTTP 1.1 uh, and version 2. However, if there are clients which support, for example, one only version 1.1, they can establish communication, uh, TLS communication with the website and negotiate with the server that only version 1.1 of HTTP would be used. 
And this is one typical use case of how you can use application layer protocol negotiation between a client and a server. Um, and it also allows the server to send different public certificates based on the application protocol that's negotiated. For example, if, you, if a, a site can send you one public certificate for HTTP 1.1, if, if, if it serves HTTP 1.1 through TLS, and can send a completely different public certificate for HTTP 2.0 uh, based communication. And in order to enable ALPN in JDK 9, uh, first you need to call the set application protocols method which just accepts uh, an array of strings which specify the names of the protocols that are supported by either the client or the server. Uh, then you need to trigger, of course, the handshake process. Uh, you might trigger it by explicitly calling start handshake or begin handshake on SSL engine, or you can use the read or write methods to trigger the handshake. And then if you want to get the concrete application protocol that's been negotiated after the TLS handshake, you can call the get application protocol method from the client or server SSL socket. This will return a string that identifies which is the negotiated application protocol between the parties. Also, you can do some more advanced application protocol name resolution by setting the so-called handshake application protocol selector. In that particular example, uh, uh, if the cryptographic shifter that's being used is RC4 and the size of the packet buffer is bigger than uh, uh, one kilobyte, then I return protocol one, otherwise I return protocol two. As you can see, this is a bit more advanced way to establish how you, how you choose the application protocol that's used during the TLS uh, communication. Now, to see a concrete example of all that we have set for now, I'll be using a custom implementation of a banking server. It's basically implemented using uh, the new uh, Java 9 modules uh, implemented by Project Jigsaw. Uh, our banking server basically is a fairly simple Java application that allows us to, to host different third-party applications. And we have different protocol implementations that are provided to that banking server. Uh, one implementation is, for example, for the XMPP protocol, another is for the SIP protocol. Those protocol implementations can be used by different applications of the banking server to establish communication with different third-party applications within the bank. This is our demo scenario. Okay, so let's, let's look into the code. Uh, first, our banking server. Uh, it's fairly simple. Uh, I'm using the service loader utility to load all the applications that are present on the class path of the banking server. And for all those applications, I call the execute method to execute the application. Uh, in order to provide an API for all the protocol implementations, I have the banking protocol interface, which has an execute method, which allows me to execute a concrete protocol message using the particular protocol implementation. Uh, and in order to see how a concrete protocol implementation looks like, I have this alpha protocol, which basically just uh, writes sending some alpha, pro alpha protocol packet. And I also have a fixed protocol implementation. This is just another application protocol. Uh, and in order to demonstrate the use of, of that ba simple banking server, uh, I'll be using a demo application. And my demo application basically uh, is like this. It just says executing the demo application. It creates the proper packet using some protocol. Then it gets the protocol service which is provided by the banking server and it sends the packet by specifying uh, the concrete message protocol, uh, protocol I would like to use. In that particular case, I would like to use the fixed protocol. And since I mentioned this is basically, uh, all of this is uh, divided into Jigsaw modules. They have this module info file which specifies the modular information for my, for my module. I would like to compile and execute this application. In order to do that, um, first thing I need to compile basically uh, my demo application. I've already compiled the other modules for the server and the protocols. And then I want to execute that uh, by specifying that the main class is coming from the banking server module. When I execute that, you can see simply that basically I'm triggering some fixed protocol packet through the banking server using the demo application. Now, I would like to demonstrate, for example, how I can use application layer protocol negotiation. First thing I would like to do is, is in the banking protocol, 
I'll change the, uh, sorry, in the demo application, I'll change the protocol I'd like to use to XMPP. And I have implementation of the XMPP protocol, which is this one. To look into that, the XMPP protocol implementation is uh, using basically uh, standard SSL sockets, as we saw them earlier in the slides. And one specific thing here is that I set the application protocols which are supported by the client or the protocol implementation. This is XMPP version 1.0. Now, in order to demonstrate that, I need to start uh, a simple uh, socket server. And my so socket server basically looks like this. My socket server basically is a standard SSL socket server, and it also calls the set application protocols method to specify which protocols are supported by the server. In that particular case, I specify XMPP 1.1 and XMPP 1.2. As you can imagine, when the client sends a, uh, starts uh, establishing communication with the server, we have in common the XMPP version 1.0 protocol. Now, let's compile again my demo application, but before that, I'll start the SSL socket server. And now if I go and compile again my application and run it, as you see here the negotiate protocol is version 1.1. This is in fact the, the first protocol in common that's uh, present in the client and the server. Uh, if I want to see how I can use DTLS, let's imagine that for some reason I'm implementing uh, a protocol implementation for my banking server that interacts with some third party SIP client within the bank. For example, this is some server that provides me with some chat capabilities within the bank. For that reason, I'm going back to my uh, demo application. And I'm changing here the protocol to SIP SIP. For the SIP protocol, I have uh, an implementation of the banking protocol, and it looks like this. It's much much more complex because it basically uses the non-blocking SSL engine API that provides implementation of DTLS. I'll not go into the full implementation of this because it takes uh, into account a lot of corner cases, uh, but I'll look into specifically how is the uh, SSL engine created. Here I create an instance of SSL context f specifically for DTLS. Uh, I provide some initialization. Here I don't specify any key and trust store. Uh, then I create an SSL engine. Uh, I specify that this is a, a DTLS client using the set use client mode. Uh, and then I return that engine. And here I also have a specific handshake method which is establishing the handshake process and it takes into account some corner cases which are not covered by default through the DTLS API. But as I said, it's fairly complex so I'll not go into the details here. Uh, and now I want to see what is the DTLS server. Um, the DTLS server... is this one. It basically creates an instance of SSL engine pretty much in the same way as for the client. And it's also fairly complex because it does pretty much the same thing as the client to, uh, during the handshake process. Um, so if I start basically this server and then I compile my application again. I've changed the protocol in my demo application to SIP. And I run that and set some SIP protocol. Uh, and basically, it, it hangs. It doesn't return properly because, first of all, I didn't specify the proper shifters that are negotiated between the client and the server. This is just uh, a demonstration how basically you can, you can create this DTLS uh, communication. So that, that's pretty much it about um, ALPN and DTLS. One more uh, interesting addition to the new APIs in Java 9 is uh, the so-called OCSP stapling. Uh, let's look, in fact, into the rest of the security enhancements and we'll discuss some of them into some more details. So as I said, one of the, the other enhancements around uh, TLS is OCSP stapling. OCSP, OCSP stapling is the ability for the SSL server to do the certificate uh, revocation checking. 
Uh, as you know, typically that's the responsibility of the client. The client receives the public certificate and uses the certificate authority to do the certificate checking. However, since this might imply a lot of requests sent from clients to do certificate checking, some of those requests might be offloaded by doing the certificate revocation checking from the server. And that's the purpose of OCSP stapling. Um, so the, yeah, the main goal here is to reduce the number of uh, client requests and respectively responses that are res res retrieved from the certificate authority. And in order to enable OCSP stapling, you just need to specify several uh, options, Java options. One for the, is, uh, for the server and one for the client. You need to specify JDK TLS server enabled status requests extension equals true uh, for, the, for the server, for the SSL server. And you also need, for the client, you need to specify JDK TLS client enabled status request extension true. And the check revocation option uh, was, must also be set to true. Uh, another new thing in JDK 9 is that by default we have PKCS 12 key stores. Up until now we had a Java proprietary format for key stores which was called JKS or Java Key Store. But this format was quite limited in regard to capabilities. So, so that's why they decided to switch to, the, to a more standard um, format for, um, for key stores which is called PKCS 12. It's very well defined by a specification and it has much more capabilities than the proprietary JKS key store. Another benefit from this is that you can basically exchange key stores with different applications, for example, .NET, Python, and so on. You don't need to do conversion from JKS to another type of key store used by another application, non-Java application. So it basically provides better interoperability with other applications. Uh, other enhancements are basically more um, secure implementation, um, more um, a better implementation of uh, secure random algorithms, uh, which is backed by uh, support for um, processor instructions. Uh, there are some additional uh, processor instructions for GHash and RSA series of algorithms, cryptographic algorithms, and we also have an implementation of the SHA-3 series of hash algorithms. And as a summary of all this, as you see, basically JDK 9 introduces some significant set of security enhancements, especially around the TLS support that's provided by JDK. Uh, and basically, we, we hope that with upcoming releases of JDK, there will be more support for the TLS series of protocols and, of course, uh, support for stronger cryptographic algorithms. Any questions about the security enhancements in JDK? If not, then uh, thank you for, for the attention. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ping me after the, the session.